Okay, hello everyone and welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are the Horticulturists here joining you from our own homes this time to answer all of your gardening questions. We uh, think that gardening is as important as ever right now, so we're kind of focusing this episode on some tips on how to get started in the garden, and then we're also just here to answer all your gardening questions. Uh, my name is Candace Hart. I'm the State Master Gardener Specialist for Illinois Extension. I live in Bloomington, Illinois, so I'm in Central Illinois. And I've got two of my awesome colleagues on today who are also going to introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Kelly Alsip, and I'm also a horticulture educator. And I'm also based out of Bloomington. And uh, I love answering questions about maybe some of those insects that have started appearing in your garden. Um, and talking about vegetable gardening is sort of a passion of mine. I don't want to take that from Ryan, though. It's really, uh, I think we both like to dabble in that. Ryan. Yeah, I'm Ryan Panko, horticulture educator out of Champaign. Um, and as Kelly mentioned, I love the vegetable garden. I've been really busy with that here lately. so. Excited to talk about that today, folks have questions. Um, my background is really in uh, woody plants, trees and shrubs, and all that kind of stuff. So um, that's that's kind of my area of specialty, but I, man, I like anything plants. I, I enjoy it. So. Anyway. Awesome. I think we're all really loving plants right now, that's, that's for sure. So I know we have a couple of photos we might show up later of kind of things that are going on in our garden. but. We'd love to kick it off with some gardening questions. So if you have questions, add them to the comment box and we're gonna hopefully answer them for you today. Um, and we had a couple questions to come in ahead of time so we can just kick it off and start with some questions. So this first one is a good vegetable question for you vegetable folks. I myself like flowers, I didn't mention that, so I will not be answering the vegetable questions. Uh, but the first question that came in is, where would be an ideal place for rhubarb? Where would you plant rhubarb? Rhubarb, um, well, a perennial. So mm -hmm. when I think about that, rhubarb, asparagus, um, I think about a spot that I, you know, it's kind of on the fringe of my garden. That's how I've done my asparagus. I guess I haven't actually, I don't have any rhubarb in cultivation. Have you ever grown it? Do you have any? I've never grown rhubarb. I have grown asparagus. Um, I, I agree. I think that it could be, I would put it on the fringe of the garden also, but um, if you have, uh, it could be, you know, also in, you know, your perennial beds. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's a nice looking plant, really. It's, it's attractive. Really pretty plant. Yeah. I think, mean, you know, there's this trend on using edibles in the landscape, so I don't know if I would necessarily have to limit myself to the garden space. It does spread, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it does. And, I mean, I guess when I think about my asparagus patch, you know, again, off to the side of my garden, out of an area that I do, you know, obviously any cultivation, so what asparagus has came down to, the biggest management challenge for me has been uh, keeping it weeded, and it's and weeding. It's, um, you know, right now is a great time to go in and weed and get a little layer of mulch on there and kind of hold back, hold back the weeds. So think about those kind of things with the management and where it would fit into your, your garden space. If you want to have a big patch of it, that's probably going to be the big challenge. It's just that hand weeding and keeping up on the weeds, not letting anything go to seed, um, and, and, and keeping it clear and, and for, but but weeding around your your rhubarb. So. Uh, I definitely like Kelly's idea of interspersing that in a more ornamental garden. That's something I've started to kind of mess around with a little bit is trying to integrate, you know, edible foods into our ornamental spaces to get, you know, more bang for your buck or more use out of the space. So um, yeah, I know it definitely great. needs uh, good drainage. So, um, you know, the mistake I made in the past in another garden was in that out of the way spot that doesn't drain as well, I put my asparagus. Well, it doesn't do as well there. Uh, same thing would be with rhubarb. You would want probably a pretty well drained spot. So don't use your, you know, kind of waste space like I did uh, to, to start it. But uh, those are probably the best recommendations. Are there anything else on, on rhubarb you guys would add? No, I think just a good full sun spot like you would do any other vegetables. I think it's going to be good for it. I Keep in mind it's a fairly short season that you're going to be harvesting it. So, like, I like the idea of putting in the landscape too, so that you can at least kind of get some double duty use out of it the rest of the year as a nice landscape plant. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, not to knock asparagus. I mean, I love it. It's super productive once you get a patch going. But, yeah, for a big chunk of the gardening season, after this early part of the year where we harvest, it's kind of a weeding project. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> weeding really and project. Um, so, yeah. there's that. And it looks it's like fun. it's something, rhubarb is something that you divide every four or five years. That's a, another way of keeping it in check. Yeah, and you can get more plants that way, too. Mm-hmm. Or share with neighbors. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I'll take some. Good question to start with. If you guys have questions, add them to the comment box, and we're going to answer all your gardening questions today, as well as probably talk a little bit about kind of what's going on in our own gardens. But we've got a couple other questions that came in ahead of time. And this one is another vegetable question. I think a lot of people are interested in growing food right now, which is awesome. So. They're asking, what types of vegetables can grow in a container on a south-facing deck? And they asked in parentheses, could you do lettuce, peppers, potatoes, etc.? So vegetables in a container on a south-facing deck. What do you think? The queen of container gardening with vegetables. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my entire edge of my driveway is full of tree pots that I grow my vegetables in. And I don't seem to have problems with very many vegetables. I mean, I have my, you know, my, my normal disappointments. Like, uh, sometimes it's hard for me to get peas growing. But when it comes to um, those pots, I can grow beets and lettuce and Swiss chard and kale and tomatoes. I, I tend to think that tomatoes need a huge... Um, uh, root mass to produce as many tomatoes as they want. So I've noticed when I do plant tomatoes in my pots and my straw bales versus the ground, I tend to get a little bit less. But um, I am, I'm experimenting this year. I'm going to grow some kohlrabi. I usually do the Swiss chard. I'll do peppers. I think eggplants are excellent in containers. Uh, you can have a really small container, plant an eggplant in it, and get lots of produce. Um, I love my basil. I think starting basil from seed in a container is an excellent idea with your parsley, other stuff like that. Um, it, you know, it, with the straw bell gardens, I, I even did onions and potatoes and was and was fairly successful. The only thing I wasn't successful with was um, squash. I just don't think it was enough room for it. So I would avoid maybe some of the more aggressive vegetables like zucchini or pumpkins and... Uh, focus on some of the, the greens and the root vegetables. Yeah. I, and last year I did tomatillos for the first time and it was, uh, it took over. Oh yeah. Pardon. It took over the pot. Like it was gigantic. I think it grew like three feet, four feet tall. Awesome. Yeah, it does seem like about anything you can grow in your garden, just about, you can grow in pots. So uh, south facing deck is a great spot. Should have some good good sunlight. Um, you know, one really neat thing a coworker did uh, was potatoes in a grow bag. If you've ever heard of a grow bag, you know, it's a collapsible bag that's kind of, you know, you fill it with soil and it kind of fills out to be a pot kind of thing. And then when your potatoes are ready, you can just dump out the whole bag. So, you know, whereas traditional t potatoes uh, in the garden, you'd have to kind of dig up and do a little work to get. So uh, that's kind of a neat idea. But um, yeah, I encourage you to do the gardening containers, because it actually, you know, most all of our uh, vegetable crops need really well-drained soil, and really a pot sometimes provides like that optimal well-drained soil. Now, the, the big issue with me that's been, that's been with uh, container gardening in general is just that they dry out faster. So you do have to have, be ready to water them probably a little more than you water your regular garden, and I found it, it works best for me if I have them close to my water source, so close to either... A, a spigot or a, a long hose is what I've got that stretches to my back patio where we do those. And if I've got that hose wand laying there ready to go, I'll probably water it more often than if I have to go grab a watering can or something else. So that's that's kind of one of the ins and outs of uh, container gardening is definitely having some water available. Make it easy. Yeah, I love that potato idea. I've done that with kids' gardens before, and they love 
just dumping the whole container out and finding all the all the potatoes. It's super fun to do. It's like awesome. magic. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, well, we've got some questions that have started to come into the comments, so keep those coming. Um, we've got a question here from Mary Kay. She says, with the freezing lows this and next week a couple nights, and with our apple and peach trees getting ready to blossom, what will the damage be? So below freezing temperatures and uh, fruit tree blossoms. Well, it, it all kind of depends on that stage of development. Um, yeah. You know, peaches come out first, so they're the most vulnerable. And, you know, last year here in central Illinois, uh, we pretty much lost our peach crop because that, that timing of the cold was perfect. Yeah. Um, you know, not too long ago, I kind of researched these these temperature thresholds for damage to those flowering structures. I don't, I can't think of them off the top of my head, but um, it does have to dip down quite a bit to really just wipe out all those blossoms. And I, I haven't looked at our forecast much further than the weekend here, but um, I don't think we have, you know, down into the 20s predicted, um, maybe close to freezing or the 30s, but um, I don't really, I didn't think, I wasn't worried about my plants the last time I looked at weather. I don't know. Have you guys followed it a little closer? I think I saw some like 27s, 29s so maybe like, coming next week, but it, yeah, it kind of depends how open those flowers are. I mean, if they're fully open and they're putting out pollen, then that's going to be, that could be damaging. But if I would say if they're not fully open yet, they're not quite there, that probably gives it a little bit of protection still. Candace, I actually looked that up. Did you? <laughs> oh, good. The opposite. Oh, okay. Um, I, I think, you know, inherently horticulturists would say, yes, a more open flower would yeah. be susceptible to frost. But uh, I looked that up once and it said that the actually the opening buds were a little bit more susceptible to frost than a more open flower. Okay, cool. Well, I, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said it depends where, it, both of you, it depends where it is in the stage. So, you know, maybe if it has already been pollinated, then it, losing the flowers would be okay. But one thing I learned uh, in an apple tree pruning lately was um, there's like a, um, and I'm, 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 uh, uh, I might be uh, messing up the terminology, but you know, when an apple flower opens, there's a center bloom, right? Yeah. And there's four blooms on the outside. Well, they actually bloom five, four or five days apart. So if you were to get a frost, you would only be killing out that king blossom, I think is what it's called. Yeah. The other ones would be fine um, if it does kill the blossoms and not the buds, which is opposite of what I've researched. So I think when it comes to apples, you may freeze, but then you have another window of blossoms. Okay. Well, that's good yeah, to know. That's really interesting. Yeah. So even if some of these get damaged, hopefully there's still some other blossoms coming afterwards. But I don't know about peaches. I just know that horticulturists, we don't prune peaches until we actually start to see buds open up because we're trying to save every single bud we can get. And we don't want to take out potential buds. So we don't prune them like we should in the dormant period. I'm actually fairly optimistic about peaches and apples this year. Me too, yeah. So let us keep us up to date, Mary Kay. Let us know how your how your crop goes. I know she lives in Monticello too, so she'll be in our area. So. Okay, we've got some other questions here. Question from Chris: How do I know when it's safe to move my tomato starts out to the garden? Concerned about frost. So that's a the big question always, right? When can I plant my tomatoes? What would you guys do? May 15th. <laughs> May 15th? Well, actually, what what is the last frost-free date here in central Illinois? Isn't it um, May? Yeah, it's like the, around the start of May. Yeah, I was going to say like the, the very tail end of April. Start of May. Yeah. So I just generally say May 15th before you can transplant those tomatoes. Well, yeah. May 7th. Yeah, I wonder if some gardeners kind of got a little excited this week. There's kind of a day like today when it's 70-some degrees outside, 
and you certainly you could put your tomato plant outside today, but if you're not looking ahead at the the weather forecast like we've been talking about, if it gets down below freezing, those tomatoes are a goner. So you really are better off waiting till that soil is warmed up. You've got that less danger of frost. So as excited as we can get to get it out there, it probably is better to, to really to wait till that May. But there are a ton of vegetables you can plant right now that yeah. you don't have to worry about frost. And actually frost makes them do better. Um, you know, the, the carrots, the beets, the kohlrabi, the Swiss chard, the kale. So think about maybe planting a cool season vegetable because, you know, those are going to do well in the cool weather and you don't have to worry about them. Do you guys have any vegetables planted yet in your gardens? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've got potatoes in, and I've got, boy, I, I spent some time the other day. I uh, wish I was outside today gardening right now, but uh, I've got some beds ready for some greens. I'm going to plant some lettuce and kale and spinach. Um, probably do some beets here very soon, and I, I like to do beets as a succession planting where I seed mm-hmm. you know, one little patch this week, one patch a week later. Um, to keep my kids engaged, I think we're going to do some radishes, not because they're – Super huge fans of radishes. My youngest likes radish, but um, because they grow quick, you know, they germinate fast, they grow quickly, and that, that'll give them something exciting to happen in the next you know, few weeks while other things are waiting around to germinate. Um, so that's some of the stuff I've got going on in the vegetable garden. Um, pretty much getting ready for a lot of stuff. Um, you know, and back to that topic of when do you move things outside? Um, you know, some of that is just like how much risk. How much do you want to risk things? You know, you, you could always put stuff out if they're ready right now and, we're, you know, have to worry about it till, till um we get out of this frost-free date. But uh, what I've done in the past is put out a, a single plant or something that you can maybe try and protect with a row cover or some type of cover. So there's ways you can kind of squeeze some things out. Definitely not recommended to put your whole uh, vegetable garden out right now. But um, I've seen a lot of folks squeeze out a few plants right now that they baby along and, um, and, and you know, just – Except the fact that there may be a frost risk for those. But. Well, you know, especially if you're in that competition of the first tomato of the, right. the neighborhood, right? <laughs> you got to get it out early. Yeah. You could put a bucket over it. Yeah, under that. Great. I just don't want to have to have 50 buckets out there. Yeah. yeah. Like four or five. One plant, maybe. <laughs> okay. So we my, got- my father actually used to work in horticulture, and he worked in um, New Orleans and they were growing oranges and it was supposed to freeze. So what they did is they sprinkled water mm-hmm. on these trees all night long because the actual frozen water keeps the bud at 32 degrees and won't let the other temperature go down. Um, I thought that was really interesting. I mean, I would never do that. Mm-hmm. but. Yeah, I've seen big. I think it would be really complicated to get it done, but he yeah. had to do it just to, you know, because it was his livelihood at the time. I've seen big strawberry growers do that too. Well, they'll, they'll turn the sprinklers on all night, let them freeze over, and then protect the blossoms that way. It's, mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems counterintuitive, but it works. Yeah. 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 Okay, keep those questions coming to the comment box. We've got a question here uh, from Mark. What light conditions and directions are best for establishing a new garden? What time of day is good light exposure most needed? So best light conditions and directions. So it kind of depends what he's wanting to grow, right? But, so yeah, but, let's say for a vegetable garden, for example. What would you recommend? Well, safe to say full sun. Yeah, yeah. so... Um, Six hours would be the minimum for that. I'd say I'd probably bump that up for a vegetable garden. So, I mean, yeah. a good eight hours of sun probably because um, most plants are going to require a pretty good amount of sun to be productive. Um, you know, then I guess maybe some of this question lies in would you want to focus that eight hours on morning sun or late in the afternoon? Yeah. Um, you know, that late afternoon sun is very hot and drying. And uh, that's kind of what my garden, my vegetable garden gets is a lot of its, a lot of its sun is after, you know, mid morning or so and on through till sundown and it, it does really dry out hard. So, I mean, in my opinion, I almost think that I would like to rather have my, my light shifted back towards the morning if I could, but I can't control the large shade trees that, that dictate that to me. So, 
sometimes you're just stuck with the life you have. Uh, but if you could pick, I mean, that that's my opinion. Um, Kelly, would you have a different thought on, on lights, lighting? I mean, I would definitely choose, you know, like I'm choosing the end of my driveway. I mean, I, I, you know, who gardens in the end of their driveway? The driveway is where the most sun um, hits my property. So that's why I do there. I mean, I do think there are some vegetables that don't, that do a little, will be okay with four to six hours of sun. You know, I mean, some of those leafy greens might um, do a, a bit, a, you know, be just fine. Sometimes beans don't need 100%, eight hours of sun. But uh, uh, yeah, I agree. I think it depends on, uh, you know, what you're growing. Uh, my, uh, when I always say that, you know, if it's full sun, if it's afternoon sun, you're doing pretty well. If it's just morning sun, then you're definitely part shade conditions. Uh -huh. Yeah. And coming from me, more of a flower landscape perspective, um, he asked about kind of direction wise. So if you're talking about your landscaping, if you're thinking about like a south facing side of the house or a west facing side of the house, then you're thinking about full sun plants. But if you've got a north facing or more of an east facing side, then you're thinking about more of the shade type of plant. So it really kind of depends on the side of the house you're looking at and to, will help determine what kind of plants you're looking at. Great question. Okay, we've got a question from Julie here. Um, how can I get rid of large ant hills in both my flower and organic veggie gardens? She says she has a dog, so ant traps aren't an option. Any tips on ant hills, Kelly? Um, <laughs> I'm conflicted on the whole ant conversation. I am struggling with ants in my house. And I, I did last year also, and I just allowed them to be in my house. This year they got a little out of control. You know, I've tried some of those non-trap methods, and it did not work. Um, so I actually had to put traps in my home. As far as ants being outside, they are so good for the environment. They mine the soil. They, um, you know, are part of an ecosystem. It's not like we have fire ants here. They're not like, you know, going to be a health hazard for you or your dog. Personally, I would just accept them as part of the landscape, as part of my eco-friendly garden. Um, other than that, I don't know what other advice to give you because I've tried doing it other methods and it didn't work for me. That's a tough one, yeah. That's a tough one. Yeah. So unless, yeah, unless they're really causing a, a bunch of damage or you've got another reason, maybe it is best to just kind of let them, let them live. Yeah. I have cinnamon ants in my house, and you can, when you, when you poke them, they smell, not like cinnamon, but interesting, kind of fragrant. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got another insect question here from Kathleen. Hi, Kathleen. When is a good time to spray for bagworms? I know she has bagworms on her head, her arborvitae heads in her backyard. When do you spray for bagworms? When the tree lilacs are in bloom. Okay. Which is approximately? Mm, soon? <laughs> June? June, I was, maybe? Yeah, I was thinking early. Oh, about a month. The tree lilacs, if you think about what does it, I actually could share my screen um, and look for this. Um, Bear with me, sorry, I'm trying to... I see your garden. I actually put this... No, I did not put it. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, let me escape from sharing my screen. Yeah, so really just kind of... see my screen? Oh, you stopped sharing. Of course my internet is slow. I'm so sorry. <laughs> But when the tree lilacs are in bloom, they're this—they're 
pretty very common uh, street tree that um, um, that uh, you know have these huge white plumes. But you can really tell they're lilac uh, plants just by the, their um, their uh, leaves. Um, so, uh, can you see my screen? No, I do. And I think I stopped your camera on accident. Thank you. So, thank you. No problem. So, um, so that's June. So what is happening is right now they are uh, eggs inside their dead mother inside the bags. And what they're going to do is they're going to start venturing out of the bags. And then they climb to a tip of a branch or the top of the tree, or they'll stay on that tree if there's room. And they'll put out a little um, uh, piece of um, webbing and um, silk and uh, that string of silk will carry them in the wind and they'll just happen to land on a new plant. So you think, okay, they're just, you know, risking it, but that's why you see them on such a diversity of plants because you'll see them on magnolias, on barberries, on all your evergreens because they really take advantage. And all the bags kind of look different because what they do is they start building a bag and they create that bag out of the foliage on the tree. And then they'll stick their head out of the bag and eat all around themselves. So the best time to spray for bagworms is when those tree lilacs are in bloom. Okay. Explain it well enough? Yeah, that was great. The picture is very helpful to you. Thank you. Yeah, and it's maybe a reason to plant a tree lilac. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I, great. I was, I was lucky, and in the house I live in, there was this weird tree, you know, that was by the driveway that it was kind of almost in a woodland type setting. And it turns out that was a tree lilac when we moved in, and I had enough chance to kind of look at the foliage and things. So um, I kind of appreciate having it for this timing and this phenology. Now it, it helps me to predict when to help advise folks on. Uh, you know, when to start treating for bagworms. So it's kind of Unfortunately, neat. we had a terrible year last year for bagworms. Yeah. By the time everybody comes to me and wants advice, it's too late. Yeah. Too late to spray. Uh, you can, you know, you can always pick them off. And I mean, I, I've done a lot of that. In the past, I was a, an arborist doing tree care full time and if I was in somebody's yard and I saw bagworms I was picking them off and telling them what they were and explaining some of this stuff to them so and Aaron, uh, just, Aaron just asked that so would now be a good time to physically remove bagworms if they wanted to avoid spraying yeah you could but make sure you put them you know you put them in a place where they're going to die you can't put them in a compost pile or keep them around the tree because when they hatch they're going to crawl out um, so if you're willing to pick them all off, yes, it's just usually when people have a bad bagworm infestation, picking them all off, and if the, especially if the tree is really tall, is somewhat of an issue. Yeah, not not even feasible a lot of times. Mm -hmm. But you know, I've had it on short little head high arborvitaes and things. You know, you can you can go through and pick those off pretty easy. But yeah, if you can destroy them before those uh, that. The, the babies come out, then um, that's that's good this time of year. Awesome. Or you could do like I do on walks and pick them off and dissect them to see if they're viable. Yeah, because if we have a harsh enough spirit, a harsh enough winter, which I don't know if we did. I don't think we did. Sometimes they're they it they die off. Huh. Okay, good answer. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to hop over to YouTube here. We've got a question over there from Elizabeth. Um, in zone four, when is it wise to untip the young buried roses and prune and feed an established and neglected climbing rose? So when is a wise time to untip a young buried rose? I'm assuming she means kind of unbury it. Uh, and then when's a good time to prune and feed a climbing rose? I myself don't grow a lot of roses, but I would I would definitely say that now 
is, is an okay time for sure to go ahead and unbury. Uh, if you've applied extra mold to kind of um, insulate things, I think now is a great time to start pulling that back and unburying things. And then I would probably start to uh, fertilize and um, feed once there's really active growth going. Start, those leaves are starting to come out. What would you guys say? Yeah, I agree. I agree. I'm definitely not a rose expert. I'm not a rose expert either, but yeah. just knowledge of woody plants. Yeah, I think so. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer, Kelly. Good answer. <laughs> Okay, let's see what else we've got coming in here. Oh, here's a good one from Amy. Um, I planted some dahlias into pots with soil mix and I'm keeping them in a sunny room. How long till I see grow? So I just pulled my dahlias out of storage too to kind of check on them, see how they were doing. And I do that a lot of springs too. I'll go ahead and pot them up, mainly just so I can make sure they're still viable before I go ahead and plant them outside. And from my memory, Amy, I would say it's usually maybe a week or two before I start to see any green kind of popping up. Uh, you can also kind of unbury them a little bit and just see if that eye has started to grow. Uh, that should happen within at least a week for sure. And if nothing has happened after a week or two, it's probably likely that your tubers were not, they did not survive storage very well. So I would give it a week or two. Uh, and if you're not seeing much growth after that, take it out of the pot and, and just check it and see. Good question. Uh, okay, great question, you guys. Um, okay, question here uh, from Juan. Do you foresee tomato plants being available at stores during planting season in May? If not, what can people do to get tomatoes planted by May? Is it too late to start seeds now? So... Um. I, I don't think it's too late to start seeds. Uh, you would just have a really small tomato plant. Um, you know, the general recommendation is about eight weeks before our frost-free date. So probably should have started, um, I guess that would have been, that's probably around March 1st for our area. Um, so you could still start them. Um, um, my feeling, and this is just my opinion, is that garden centers will have a pretty good supply of stuff. And I think... Um, you know, I've kind of tried to stay in touch with local nurseries just as this um, whole crisis has evolved. And uh, pretty much, I, I think they've all been deemed essential business. And so many of them are, are going ahead with a lot of their regular spring plans, but you do need to check that some have uh, different ways that we'll need to shop at them. Uh, if it's a big enough place, a, a lot of greenhouses and nurseries, at least around my area that I've talked with, are allowing folks to come and, and stay socially distanced in their spaces if they're big enough. But some of these smaller places are setting a limit of how many folks can come. So um, I anticipate that um, you know things are very uncertain. It may not be a bad idea to start to start some seeds for the first time if you've never tried it. So yeah, um, absolutely. So that's my thoughts on it. I don't know. What have you guys heard from garden centers? Yeah, I've seen the same thing too. Where some of them you can call ahead and and let them know what what you're needing and they'll have it ready for curbside pickup or they're they're open as normal but having people distance themselves but yeah i think still starting some seeds is a great still a great idea to do mm -hmm. i did that with my aunt baits at a local garden center i just said hey i want this they took my credit card they i dro drove up they gave it to me in my car i didn't have to do anything i didn't have to I know people like to peruse at plants and look, but a lot of them are, you know, putting orders together and willing to drop it off. A ton of them have delivery services, too. I mean, that's something to think about and ask when you're doing it. And yeah. to be perfectly honest, people, you know, tomato plants are gigantic sometimes when people plant them. And, you know, when you think about planting a tomato plant, you plant it up to the first two leaves. So if you have a 12-inch tomato plant, you're planting it 10 inches deep. We don't do that with other plants. We do it with tomatoes because they're vines and they produce roots all along the stem. So a smaller tomato plant actually might be better in the long run. Um, yeah, and in less time... You know, to look at the bright side, less time you have to nurse it along inside. I mean, I know in a 
at a certain point here, my seeds I've started are going to have, I'm going to start to have problems with space. With those, you know, I don't have a very big grow light system. So that's, um, not to go into a giant discussion of, uh, seed starting, um, unless folks are interested, but you do need some type of source of light. That's a mistake a lot of folks make is I think, uh, even the sunniest window, I, in my opinion, would never support uh, seed starting well enough if you're trying yeah. to do very much. Yeah. So. Yeah, I've, I've had mine going in my garage with the fluorescent bulbs right up. And actually, I brought one in case there was show and tell sign. Mm -hmm. I have a big flat of marigolds here that are doing good. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Those babies. Yeah. Hey, marigolds will take cool season, wet, cool season. So you can plant those now. I know they're looking good. Well, yeah, formed. Definitely got to have the light. How does the root? How do the roots look? I don't know. Let's see. Let me pull some out. Let's do a let's do a test. Fine. I kind of overseeded, so there's multiples in a in a thing. All right, pretty good. So you pretty need good. to wait maybe a little, a couple more weeks to. Yeah, get ideally, I want to be able to pull that out, and the whole plug will, mm -hmm. will come with. So yeah, I only plant. I planted these. Well, it's probably mid mid March, so they're only probably three weeks three weeks into it. So definitely good. Good job. I'll set. I'll place my order now. I'll take yeah, if, if you need some miracles, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> okay, let's see what other questions we've got coming in here. Keep them coming. Uh, question here: What is the best flowering tree to plant in our zone? Which they believe they're in zone five. We are here in Central Illinois. Um, they would like it to grow tall oh to not grow tall sorry five or six feet tall so Ooh. a very small flowering tree in zone five what would you do so if it's five or six feet tall it's going to be called a shrub <laughs> yeah or a dwarf some type of dwarf <laughs> flowering tree um ryan i'm sure you have an opinion you have a yeah um i mean it's, it's kind of hard to to fit that mold of a super short tree, um, you know, in my opinion, as far as flowering trees and what has just the best display in a small, a star magnolia would probably be one of my choices. Uh, they do get a little taller, but uh, definitely taller than five or six feet. Um, back to the concept of shrubs, you know, I think there's a lot of shrubs that have really excellent flowering that you could probably plant. Um, you know, some of my favorites there in the hydrangea. Uh, Genus, you know, um, so I really like Annabelle hydrangea. I've planted a lot of those over the years. Um, mm -hmm. Oak leaf hydrangea is a really pretty one um, with, you know, great flower display, a really good fall color, and then some winter interest of exfoliating bark. Um, you know, some of just the smaller trees in general, if, if it's truly a tree you want, you probably need to be willing to accept a, you know, 10 or 12 foot tall plant. And so you know, kind of my short list of those would be, you know, red bud is a great one. I have a ton of red buds around my house. Um, you know, back back to the magnolias, uh, saucer magnolia is a little bit taller of a plant, but uh, something that I just became aware of in the last, I don't know, five years or so, it's probably been around longer than that, is um, there's some varieties of saucer magnolia that have been bred to be very columnar or skinny. So they're not, they don't get very wide, but they still get uh, fairly tall, maybe up to 12 or 15 feet tall. But stay super skinny so what I like about those is that you can plant them into a bed of other things and then you don't have a big shade plant in the long run you have a tall skinny magnolia so um, that's maybe they're a little harder to find but that's another one that if you're just kind of I don't know that you know my thought behind having a shorter plant is that it doesn't shade out a lot of other things usually so that's one way you can get a taller plant that's skinnier that just does a little less shading um, you know, I'm trying to think along the lines of some other small trees that kind of have nice flowering. Um, well, and sometimes you can find things that would typically be a, a bushy shrub that have been trained to more of a tree form. So, for example, I can, my mom's garden, she has a, a panicle hydrangea that's been trained into a, into a tree form. So instead of being a bushy panicle hydrangea, now it has more of a single stem with growth at the top. So going the shrub route, but just looking for different habits could work too. Yeah, yeah just on the, the, to me, like the most ornamental, smallest tree you could probably get, it doesn't really flower too great, but it's Japanese maples. There's just yeah. a ton of varieties of those and they stay small. They can be a bushy small tree or a, you know, tree shaped small tree. And um, 
just that beautiful foliage all summer long. So it's maybe sometimes better than the flowering aspect. That's true. I'm looking at my uh, um, my uh, <clears throat> under the canopy. Ah. Under the canopy. Uh -huh. Which we have plenty of these publications. As soon as our office is open, we'll send them to you. <laughs> We've got but they. It, they talk about you know I love viburnums, but that is something that might get a, a little bit taller than six feet. Um, you know, probably double that. But um, they have in here um, a Fox Valley River birch, which I have no experience with that, Ryan. But they say it only gets eight to ten feet tall. Huh. Interesting. But I would go for the. I personally think hydrangea. Oh, yeah, that's what I would go. So oh, beautiful. They're easy to grow. They're easy to take care of. Um, they just make a garden. So if you're willing to let the spread go a little bit, I kind of agree with Ryan with the hydrangeas. But they, they do look, I, I like panicle hydrangea as a tree form. Uh -huh. I've seen that around a lot. I think that really works well. So uh -huh. it's something to look at, yeah. Cool, great question. Keep those questions coming into the comment box and we'll answer those. Uh, I'm gonna go back. We had a couple other questions that came in ahead of time. Um, we've got one from Jane here that came in our inbox, um, and I'd, I'll probably have, to, we'd probably have to do some research on this, but is there any safety concerns of leaching from different plastic container pots? So, for example, could you use a Rubbermaid container as a, like a vegetable container? Has anybody seen any research regarding that? I mean, isn't Rubbermaid food grade? I personally see no problem with it. Yeah, from what I've read in the past, um, you know, really, although plastic does kind of raise a little concern for me, it's that's not really the area to be concerned with uh, materials for container plants and stuff you're going to consume. Now, if it's flowers and things, there's maybe less concern with this. Yeah. But uh, your stuff that's made out of treated lumber, that's going to be an issue. Uh, metal pots are an issue. They can leach some things, depending on what kind of metal it is. Um, and that's sometimes hard to tell for us as the consumer what kind of metal that might be. Um, and then glazed pots, there's something in the glazing that has, um, can release something. So, you know, your terracotta unglazed pots, those are fine. I've grown plenty of stuff in those. Uh, but really on that list of, you know, no-nos for vegetable gardening, uh, some of these plastic pots are, are not really perceived to be an issue. So, um, so yeah, especially um, if, some, if it was in a garden center and it was labeled for vegetable gardening, that's one way to assure yourself, but I'm guessing it's probably just pots that you have. Um, for me, anyway, I, I've used plastic containers for tomato plants and other things that we've grown in pots, and I'm not yeah. worried about it. So, so have I, yeah. And if, you, and if you are concerned, you can always line a, a, a container. There's a question here, uh, how about concrete blocks, like for making raised bed container gardens, or if it is, which I think are... Um, I don't know much about concrete blocks, so I couldn't tell you either way. But if you're ever concerned, you could always take black landscape plastic and line the bed too, so that the soil or the container, so the soil doesn't come in contact with the material. So if you're if you're concerned, that's always an option too. Just making sure you maintain drainage, put some holes in it at the bottom. But yeah, that's what I was going to say. Is some way some way for water to get at the bottom. So it's like the sides that you're really wanting to protect contact from, but yeah. on the bottom of whatever it is got to have some openings for yeah and i think a lot of studies have, have shown that a very amount very small amount of things are can actually be moldable in soil uh, so if you're growing a tomato plant for example most potential things that could be harmful they don't move very easily in soil so your, your risk factor is not very great but it's more so the actual soil itself so like if you grew a container in a contaminated soil or next to a contaminated Material and you didn't wash the soil off, that's where the, the danger can come a little bit more. So, I have to piggyback on that. I saw that at an urban urban conference once yeah. that, yes, you know, um, you know, tomato plants that when, if you eat the fruits, they're less likely for you to get contaminated. If you eat the leaves, less likely. The root crops are a little bit, you know, you, you're. It, the root crops might have a little bit more problems, but when it actually comes to 
growing vegetables in urban soils, it's the soil to human contact that's more of a concern than the vegetables taking up those contaminants. Good point, yeah, good point. Because we all like to get our hands in the dirt, right? Right, yeah. And we like to eat our apples without washing our hands. Well, not now. Yeah, and wash your hands. <laughs> Always in the dirt. <laughs> Uh, let's see, a follow-up comment from Julie uh, regarding the short flowering tree question. She says she has a pagoda dogwood. Mm. Uh, she said, although it does have a wide canopy, that might be a, a good option, too. Yeah, we did mention dogwoods. So that would be yeah. very good. Good one. Uh, question from Emily. What's the rule of thumb for hardening house plants to move them outside for the summer? Great question. Kelly, you want to see that? Yeah, most uh, tropical houseplants, you know, think about it, they do not like below 55 degrees. So until it is consistently 55 degrees or above, they don't go outside. Yeah, good answer. Easy. Uh, you know, it's just, you know, they are way more susceptible than even that little tomato plant you could put out there. So um, they're not going to be that happy. So. I usually, you know, wait until as long, you know, at least after May 15th. Yeah, this is that kind of Mother's Day, Memorial Day-ish. Yeah, I, I will admit I've been putting some of mine out. I have some succulents in the garage that I have on a cart. And every once in a while on a day like this, I'll roll them outside, mm -hmm. let them get some sun. But then I'll wheel them back in before the evening because it's going to get cold. I know uh, at my office, I have a ton of succulent plants, and I was like, oh, I wish I could just take them home and put them on my front porch, but I know I can't do that just yet. Yeah, me too. Like, well, I just want to clear out the garage and get them out of there, but I know I can't do it yet. And it's always good to do it slowly and gradually and have a little, like Candace is doing, have a little exposure a little bit at a time, bring them back in. That's, that's yeah. usually what I do is kind of slowly move them out on a nice... Today's a great day to get a little bit of sun on them, but you know you wouldn't want to set them out there all day in really strong afternoon sun. So yeah, yeah. and I and I've made that mistake before where I'll just take my succulents out straight from the garage straight and just leave them out, and they get a lot of sun scalds. And I mean they grow out of it, but you definitely can shock them if you go do that straight away. I've done that in a in the house with um, a hoya where it was in a more shaded location in the house, not right up against the window, then I put it right up against the window and, oh, this, it, oh, yeah. the sun damaged it. Sun is intense. So, yeah. you know, maybe, she, maybe Candace is going to put her succulents under the edge of the garage in the beginning, yeah. and then yeah. maybe she'll move them a little further out a little bit later before she just puts them directly in full sun. Exactly. Permanently. Yeah. She might be giving them full sun now for a couple of hours. That's yeah. Okay, but she's not yeah. going to permanently just, here, take it. Go from a shaded garage to full sun. Exactly. Well, and Kelly, your example is really interesting because the only variable there, for the most part, is the light. And just mm -hmm. it just shows, like, just that light change like that can super stress out a plant. So when you think about going from indoors to outdoors and the added wind that would be on the plant, um, Changes in humidity and less stable humidity than we have in our indoor places, you know. So, so there's just a lot more factors when you actually do take it from inside and plunk it all the way outside. So yeah, great, great example of just how to, you know, just light changes can affect them, let alone all these other things. Ryan, I think this is a great transition on, can you explain to the audience a little bit about what you're going to do with hardening off your seedlings and advice for them? Sure. Sure. So um, what Kelly's talking about is, is plants that I've started indoors and I'm getting ready to put outdoors. So in about, yeah, about a month, I usually look at May 1st and kind of, sometimes I even push that a little earlier. I don't mind a little bit of risk there of frost. I just hope, you know, look, look at the 10 day forecast and oh gosh, it looks good. I'm going to go. Um, but uh, what, what you can't do is just like we've talked about with these house plants, you can't take a plant that's been grown indoors and hasn't been exposed to wind. Uh, fluctuations in temperature and humidity and the you know the changes that happen daily and nightly uh, outside and expect those plants to be healthy it, it can actually kill sensitive plants like tomatoes and other things so 
um, harping off is a process of just getting them out there and getting them a little bit of exposure. And it's kind of like what we just described with these house plants, where it's just going to be a little tiny dose of a couple hours of sun the first time, and then the next time it's going to be a little more sun that you know. And and so I'll have I'll try to do several sessions of that before I'm putting them outside. And I don't have a set number. I don't necessarily know of research that tells the exact number, but um, as my plants get larger, I'm trying to get them just, it's almost like when, when I'm not stuck at home all the time <laughs> and I'm working, it's basically when I'm at home and have a chance to do that. So that might only be on the weekends. That might be at the end of the day when I get home from work for the last couple hours of sunlight, I get them out. So now I actually, I'd, I'd love to hear uh, both of your thoughts on what would be the optimal, because I think this is the one year of my life I have the chance to do the optimal thing with hardening off. But, but that's usually how I do it. I try to, for a, for a period of a week or more, usually up to maybe sometimes two weeks, I'm fiddling around with trying to get my plants in and out and trying to get them just a little bit of exposure to wind and sun and things. Yeah, I've kind of started some of mine to like this flat of, I've got a full shelving unit full of flats like this. And the last couple of days when it's been nice temperatures, I've been kind of just rolling the whole cart out there kind of after lunch. So just kind of putting it out for the afternoon and then bringing it back in um, for the evening. And so far that seems to be uh, working pretty well. But yeah, normally I would not be able to do that. <laughs> I would just do it when how I get long, it. How long will you do that, Candace? Like for how many weeks? Or probably, they, I don't know, maybe two weeks probably. Because a lot of, well, and also just a lot of the stuff that I'm doing this for, it's, I'm not, it's not time to plant it yet anyway. So I'll, I'll keep it, I'll keep it going. But like these marigolds, I could, in theory, put these outside because they'll tolerate those colder temperatures. But I'll keep probably hardening them for another week or so before I do that. I don't think there's like this exact recipe on hardening off vegetables. I think if you just think about it a little bit, you're going to be more successful um, you know, personally, I, I'm not, I, I don't start seed at home, which I am this year, um, or I usually direct seed or buy plants, and usually the plants that I buy are grown in a greenhouse or a, land, a nursery where they've already really been hardened off, so, but, uh, I know I've just done it, like, you know, a couple of days where I'm like, okay, you can be out here for a little bit, now go in this shady, you know, just like I do with the house plants, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of whatever you can afford to do a lot of times. Yeah, really, whatever you have time for. But it is really, <laughs> really an important step you shouldn't skip. Yeah. yeah. We have plenty of time, Candace. I know, right? Now we're good. <laughs> okay, we've got five minutes left, and we've got at least one question that's come in. So if you have some, get them in there. Um, good basic question from Kaylee. As a new gardener, how do you know you've watered your vegetable plants enough, and when in when is the best time to do so? So how do you know when you need to water your vegetable plants? When it comes to pots, I see the water come out the bottom of the pot, I'm good. But just know when I'm seeding in a pot, I sprinkle water every single day, but I don't try to saturate all the soil in that pot. I'm just keeping them moist. Once they've emerged, then I kind of back off of the watering a little bit and only water them if I think they're dry. It isn't until they get huge and really fill the pot, then I'm looking for the water to come out the bottom because I know that the roots have filled the pot. Um, I think watering can be somewhat tricky because in the beginning when you're seeding, it's like water every day. Then once you have your seedlings emerge, it's like hold off a little bit, don't overwater them. But then when they get big, you have to water more and more. As far as the garden is concerned, it is, you know, the standard is one inch a week. I would check my rainfall and think about how much rain have I gotten? Maybe even put a little rain gauge out there. I don't know how Ryan does this, but you know, some plants like one inch, some plants like two inches, and that could help you determine if you need to water your garden. Of course, a wilted tomato plant needs water. If it wilts, it, and usually they're the first. Do you have a good indicator plant, Ryan, that tells you it's time to water? Oh, 
I don't know, just I, like I think my green beans kind of show wilting a little sooner than others a lot of times when I have everything going in the garden. Um, I don't know, squash maybe starts to kind of wilt a little bit. I'm trying to think. Yeah, obviously like the uh, leafy greens probably start to show a little sooner than like say a tomato plant or a pepper plant. Um, I don't know, I can't, I think probably for me, um, like Kelly mentioned, like natural rainfall is a good indicator if you can kind of try and follow that and think about it. Um, you know, if you're really questioning it, um, it never hurts to just go get a finger or two into the soil around the plant's roots. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Just put your finger down there and see. Yeah, you can feel if the soil still has some moisture in it or if not. And um, I think it, as you garden more in the same spot, you start to get a feel for that as you're kind of trying to water um, and, and be efficient in how you use your time and your water. So, you know, some of that comes into what, what your watering method is. So, I mean, for vegetable gardening, what I absolutely love is drip tape as a watering method. And, you know, it's kind of complex to set up. I know uh, my wife is a fellow gardener. She, you know, she gardens right along with me and a lot of this stuff. She's not the biggest fan of the drip tape because it has pipes going everywhere and all kinds of stuff all over the garden where... You know, uh, in the last couple of years, we've done overhead, you know, overhead watering, which I'm not a fan of because um, it's just a lot of it evaporates. In the case of uh, tomato plants and with fungal diseases, there's a lot of things that can be spread with that splashing water. Um, so uh, the, that's probably the least efficient method, but we've kind of switched to, we moved to this house that I live in in 2017, and we're kind of still adjusting to the new garden space. And so... I, I hope to slip out the uh, drip irrigation system this year and see if it'll work in this new gardening setup because that's like the least, uh, that's the most efficient way to get it right to the plant. With drip tape or drip irrigation, you can get it right down the row of plants and it's right on the root balls of everything. And then um, what I've always done in the past is set that on a timer once you get to the hot part of the year. You know, early in the season right now, it, it maybe isn't every day that I have to run it because we'll get some rainfall, things will cool off. and you know, cooler temperatures result in less evaporation, so you can plan on that rain sticking around a little longer. But um, once it gets into the end of June and rain starts to shut off and temperature starts to really get hot, um, it was almost like a daily timer for my vegetable garden for that drip tape to go off. So it's just, it totally depends on the time of year. Right now is the easy part of the season. You know, focus your time on keeping the weeds out right now and um, the watering is you know, later in summer uh, really hit that hard. And don't estimate, uh, don't underestimate the beauty of straw mulch. <laughs> yeah, mulch just helps for sure. Yeah. Good question. Okay, a couple f last final questions here. A uh, comment from Erin. Back to our conversation about hardening off. She said she likes to tell. This is one of our colleagues. She likes to tell students three to four days in the shade, three to four days in the sun, bringing them in at night, and then leaving them outside full time for a week, and then the plant them. So that's oh. a good. It's a good time schedule. Yeah, we need to make a numbers. infographic on that. Infographic. <laughs> okay, two final questions, both kind of related. Um, Juan asks, a good environmental friendly way to get rid of grubs. Okay, then I'm going to give the second question. Uh, Robin asks, any way to prevent Japanese beetles? Best way to deal with them if we get them. So first off, environmental friendly way to get rid of grubs and then how do we prevent Japanese beetles? I like that. There's actually uh, nematodes that you can order off of the internet and water your lawn, and those nematodes will start to attack those grubs. Now, it, you know, anything biological is never going to be 100%. Um, part of me thinks that most of the time we don't have to worry about grubs unless they're really attacking your lawn and you see damage in your lawn, then you don't have to worry about grubs. Um, but yeah, the nematodes would be a really um, good biological, and all you have to do is nem Google nematodes, Japanese beetle grubs, or grubs in the lawn, and you can probably find that product. And I would definitely follow the directions. Because is it milky spore? I'm going to be What's super important. Yeah, I love, I love that, you know, fighting, fighting biology with biology. That's a cool way to do it. Mm -hmm. awesome. And, you know, those nematodes, if they don't find an actual grub to um, enter, um, they'll die off once it, 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 um, once it 
dries out. So I used to, when I did nematodes for um, soil dwelling pest, I used to make sure it was a shady day or I'd water really well before and make sure that uh, maybe I got some rain. So just made it more viable longer, but you know, those nematodes are going to go straight to those grubs. Okay, and then how about any way to prevent Japanese beetles and deal with them if we get them? Pull out everything that attracts them. <laughs> Don't plant any plants ever. No roses, <laughs> no crab apples. Oh, I say that, but I still plant basil every single year. Yeah, yeah. I think the secret to Japanese beetles is to attack them when you first see them. If you, what they do is they leave out a feed, they leave a feeding hormone. And that says to all the other Japanese beetles, hey, this is a food source. So if you can get them off your plants in the first week or two, um, knocking them off in the morning into soapy water, in the evening at dusk when they're lethargic, pinching off that, le that, um, um, that eaten foliage can really help and prevent them from you know, coming and absolutely decimating the plants. But then um, another thing is row covers. I mean, I know people don't want to see their roses covered up with white row covers, but um, that's really the only way. Um, otherwise, you're going to be spraying chemicals almost every day or every other day, and you're going to be potentially killing off really good insects. I'd rather you just let the Japanese beetles decimate your plants and let those plants come back with new growth than to spray a chemical and potentially kill other things that are pollinating those plants. Well, I, I really like exclosure, just like mm -hmm. walling off the beetles from it. With row, co row cover is the simplest thing, and um, you know, if, if it's any help, just tell yourself it's only for this one month the Japanese beetles are around. It's not for the rest of my life. Um, you know, obviously Kelly's advice on preventative stuff is the best thing you can do. But once they do, they do get once they get to a certain point. Just getting that row cover on and excluding them is a simple thing. And, you know, the biggest problem I've got is, like, blackberries and raspberries. They just love. And so I, I'm trying to keep them off of Yeah, in the food forest, we use, um, please, if I, the calcine clay. Oh, uh, I've heard of that. Mm -hmm. it, it's just. It's kaolin. Kaolin. That's it. It just covers the leaves. Um so they won't eat it. So that's one thing we do for the blackberries and the raspberries. Cause you know, you kind of don't want to cover them when they're being pollinated too. Yeah. And that's, that's organic. You know, it's just, it's just clay. It's no kind of chemical or anything. It's just a physical barrier kind of like excluding with a net. Yeah, if you want to mm -hmm. look at it that way. Awesome. Well, good tips. Well, that was our last question of the day. So, I want to thank everybody for asking awesome questions today. We really appreciate you guys hopping on and talking with us today. Uh, get out there and garden. There's a lot we can be doing outside right now. Um, we're going to be back on on April 22nd with the same format. So get out there and garden. And if you have questions, things to share, uh, mark your calendar and join us on the 22nd. Can't wait to talk to you again. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.